Well, good afternoon. I think most of our registered participants have already entered the webinar. Uh, my name is Isabel Casasus. I'm the president of the EAP, the European Federation of Animal Science. And I would like to welcome you all to this webinar, which is the first of the new EAP webinar series that we are starting today. Uh, as you probably know, the EAP is an organization devoted to the promotion of the uh, uh, research and dissemination of animal science amongst the scientific community, academia, uh, the livestock sector, and also the civil society. We offer several services to our members, among which uh, the annual meetings, the uh, uh, technical workshops and uh, several publications that target, target a, a global audience. And we have been offering this, adapting to, to new changing times during our 70 years of history. However, over the past year, COVID-19 has caused an, unpre an unprecedented change in the way we work because we've had to to adapt uh, the way we do things to to a very to a very different um, uh, way of working, um, conducting our day-to-day -day work, uh, collaborating with our partners, and sharing our results and so on. So most of our activities have moved online, which has been quite challenging, especially at the beginning when we were not so proficient in the use of all these platforms. We know it's difficult to compete with the personal interaction that we can have on on-site meetings, but we also see that there are great opportunities in online exchange. We could confirm that in our recent uh, annual meeting, which was virtual, and we had there more than 1,400 participants presenting and discussing their research results. We had more than 1,000 presentations that were displayed at an online conference platform over four days, which was quite a challenge, but we were very satisfied with the results. And uh, I have to announce that we have just closed the abstract uh, presentation deadline for the annual meeting that we will have this year. And we have almost 1,100 abstracts that have been sent again for the meeting this year. Um, these online events that we can offer now are quite attractive because they are easy to attend. There's no travel involved. We can have a global audience and panels of speakers. And also we think that a high level of interaction can, can be reached if we use the, the adequate tools. And besides, uh, if we have the recorded versions, we can uh, watch them after the event and they provide a high quality material for, for online teaching and training. So for all these reasons, we wanted from EAP to take this opportunity to deliver the series of webinars that we are starting today which are open both to, to EAP members and to non-members. Our objective is to, to offer monthly webinars with hot topics regarding animal science, where we will invite top speakers to present their latest research and views on the matter. You will be able to follow up on our next webinars at the EAP webpage, where you will also have the recorded versions of the previous ones. We can, re we can already advance that we have uh, uh, after this seminar, we will have the, ne the next one on March the 21st, and it has already a very interesting program prepared by the, by the EAP, Insect Scientific Commission, on the growing sector of insects used as animal feed. So I encourage you to regularly check our webinar site at eap.org for updates. Um, today, we have chosen a topic which has been around us for more than a year now, which is the impact of COVID on the livestock, on the livestock sector, on livestock farming. Um, this has caused, as we said, an unprecedented change, uh, quite a tremendous disruption on, on agriculture. And uh, we have had to, to adapt at very different levels of the food supply chain. We have to say that the livestock sector reacted quite quickly because both farmers and the industry uh, made a great effort, especially during the first lockdowns, to um, keep their business as usual or as close as possible to that and ensure the supply of food to the markets uh, in the short term. And for that, they have been widely acknowledged by society. However, we can now appreciate uh, the many other consequences that uh, COVID has had and is having on the long run 
which has only added to other challenges the livestock sector was already facing. And in this context, research and innovation will be essential to help the livestock sector um, be prepared for the different current and potential scenarios that the new normal, whatever it is, will bring. So different disciplines need to be mobilized in order to build a roadmap for a sustainable livestock sector that can uh, guarantee food security and at the same time protect animal, human and, and environmental health. To address all these topics, we have uh, prepared uh, uh, quite an interesting program today and we have four excellent speakers that will uh, address uh, the different topics of the impacts of uh, COVID-19 on the livestock sector. First, we will have uh, Martin Scholten from Wageningen University and Research, who will analyze the impact of, of COVID on animal research and fu funding policies. Then we will have Christian Gortaza from the University of Castilla-La Mancha in Spain, uh, who will deal with, with its impacts on animal health and farming. We will have a small comfort break and thereafter, uh, Laura Boyle from Chigas in Ireland will um, address the, the effects it's had on humans, animals and environmental health in what is called the uh, one, one welfare approach. And finally, Michael Lee from Harper Adams University will analyze the impact it's had on the food supply chain and on, on the sustainability of livestock farming systems. And before we start with the presentations, I'd like to remind you uh, some basic housekeeping rules. Uh, please remember that this webinar is being recorded and it will be shared at eap.org. Please keep your cameras off and microphones muted during the presentations. If you have questions, you can type them into the chat box that you can see on your screen. Please identify yourself and the speaker you are addressing your question to, and we will select uh, these questions to be answered during the question and questions and answer time after each presentation or during the general discussion at the end of the webinar. Uh, we can either to, uh, select the questions from the chat and you can also raise your hand for, uh, for live questions during the questions and answer time. And finally, in the next days, you will receive uh, a certificate of attendance and also a questionnaire to provide us feedback on how you find this webinar and what we can do to improve the next webinars we are going to offer. So, uh, Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, who is uh, Martin Scholten from, from Wageningen University and Research. Uh, Martin, is, um, Martin is currently a principal advisor for science diplomacy to future food and natural policies at Wageningen University and Research in the Netherlands. And he's involved with issues as uh, biocircularity in agriculture, feeding the world within the planet's current capacity, and zoonotic emergency preparedness. He is also an advisor to the Dutch government on the connections among agriculture, nature, and food. And he is also active in many European and global networks. For example, he has been uh, the president of the um, Livestock Innovation Platform uh, Animal Task Force. He is co-chair of the Global Research Alliance on Agriculture Greenhouse Gases, and he's very well known to us in EAP, where he has served as council member for some years. We are particularly grateful to Martin because, uh, for being with us today because he had another commitment and he has made a great effort to, to attend both events, so thanks very much, Martin. However, this, this also means that he won't be able to join us at the final discussion that we will have uh, at the end of, the, of this webinar. So please ask, ask your questions directly into the chat box and we will, uh, he will answer them after, after his talk. So thanks very much, Martin, and please take the stage. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel. Uh, um... Yeah, it's it, 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 good afternoon, everybody. It is, uh, it is really a, a, a privilege for me to be the first speaker in the first uh, COVID-proof uh, uh, webinar in, a, in, in the tradition of EAAP. Uh, so, yeah, that is, that is really uh, 
uh, great. And technically, hopefully, you see my PowerPoint. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, EAP, to, to, to give me and to invite me as a speaker in this uh, webinar. It's uh, my task uh, for you to, to give the expected, give an insight in the expected uh, uh, impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on animal research funding. And of course, uh, in the European perspective. So that means from the Green Deal uh, uh, ambition with the farm to fork strategy, but also from the in, in the light of the Horizon Europe, uh, the new framework program. Almost a year ago, I chaired a task force in Wageningen University and Research uh, 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 to give an idea how, uh, sorry, how COVID uh, might uh, change our world. Uh, it, the task force was named uh, the world after the, after, the, after the curve. And yeah, the, 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 the COVID is a big disruption, a worldwide disruption. Uh, uh, like what we had foreseen a year ago, it has big implications on the politics, on the economics, on the business consumers and citizens on digitalization, employment, mobility, higher education, research, technology, development and innovation funding. It, it, it's all there. It's our world because when it impacts politics, it also impacts the research funding. The same holds when it's impacting the business. Starting the analysis was with the expected first order consequences for research. What, what can you expect from, uh, from, from the research part? Well, actually, uh, we expected a reduction of the public budget for universities and research institutes to compensate the expenses related to the uh, COVID recovery. But also a stronger focus on scientific support to policies and society instead of curiosity driven and industry driven sciences. Uh, we thought that European funding will shift towards more focus on preparedness, digitalization and self-sufficiency in the European economy. Uh, also less funding for international institutions and programs due to lower donorship and fewer charities. And, and last but not least, a lower co-funding from private parties. And actually that's what we expected and, and, and we see this happening not only the direct consequences for research in general are important to consider, but also the economic uh, uh, consequences for animal production. Um, because that's the world in which we are acting. Uh, that's our uh, uh, domain. Uh, we see that the European food system and single markets are relatively uh, 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 resilient, but uh, uh, and, and that short chains and supermarkets are uh, good in business. But food services and horeca related retail market are under pressure. And the economic recession results already in reduced prices for meat and dairy. Farmers interest deviates more and more from agribusiness interests in the wake of the COVID. The policies uh, uh, responding to this kind of crisis is the European crisis policies. Actually, the European Commission has a three layer uh, crisis policy framework uh, 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 for, for that response. Uh, uh, depending on the duration of the crisis and, and, and the severity of the crisis, uh, we, 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 can, uh, 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 we can foresee that the European Commission comes first of all, on the short term with public and private interventions. You see it happens now. Uh, but it might also uh, uh, come to a second stage on the medium term with pharma cash flow support. And, and, and finally, it can result in restructuring of the production on the longer term. It depends on how the COVID crisis will develop. And on the left hand side of this slide, you see uh, a graph with a forecast that we made a year ago about uh, the financial impact of the COVID-19 aftermath in our, in our business, in our domain. 
and 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 you see that we are still on the green line uh, which, which is almost uh, uh, yeah ha happening but we can expect at the end of this year end of 2021 if uh, the the tipping point uh, whether the uh, crisis will recover, the financial impact will recover, the green line, or that the uh, 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 crisis will be more deep and more severe and more long lasting, uh, the orange line. So it will be very, very tricky to, to see what happens by the end of the year 2021. To translate this in possible scenarios of what can we expect of the future due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Krijn Poppe, uh, uh, agricultural economist at, uh, at Wageningen University and research, uh, uh, did this uh, a scenario uh, uh, study. And uh, what you see is that uh, actually there are uh, four options. You have the option that uh, 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 yeah, the, 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 the role of, 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 of the, the state, the role of the government, the role of the European Commission will not change and, and the behavior will not change. Yeah, then we, we, we will stay in the business as usual. Uh, but it only can be done, of course, if, if, if the economic recovery is, uh, is going along with that. There are people that are believing in the business recovery in a free global market after the COVID crisis. But more and more, it becomes apparent that there are two other uh, uh, scenarios possible. One is more control by the government, uh, preventive uh, 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 governmental control, or that the behavior of uh, citizens, consumers, farmers, business goes into uh, the direction of more healthier and more sustainable, uh, a more greener society in the future, uh, 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 organized not in, in, in the global market, but in regional communities. The adaptive approach uh, res based on resilience is there the, uh, 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 the key word, the capacity of complex systems to deal with change and continue to develop. But some people dream, other are faring, that it might also be an end situation uh, where we really come into a transformative situation uh, that this will mean flipping the switch towards a radical transition uh, uh, towards uh, uh, yeah, a, a smart uh, a green uh, uh, um, agriculture in, uh, in Europe, the green high-tech transformation, so-called. What does that mean for uh, uh, the second order consequences and then especially for uh, animal research? I would say these consequences are more opportunities for animal research than threats for animal research. Uh, in the uh, line of uh, preparedness, we see that uh, the interest in pandemic emergency preparedness and intervention and, and preventive health and lifestyle and uh, food quality and authenticity uh, uh, are, are rising stars. The same holds for uh, the resilience, the resilience with more regionality of supply chains, climate smart uh, land use, fostering biodiversity, and uh, uh, also here uh, uh, resilience uh, by food in diversity and, and quality and authenticity. And you can also see that there is more interest in, in, in uh, uh, digitalization and high techn technology driven data driven solutions with artificial intelligence in uh, animal production. I think these are the key uh, uh, elements of the agenda for animal research in the coming years. And I come to that later back again. Um, first of all, let's go in more detail for the preventive part. No pandemic again is the adagium, but uh, there will be new emerging infectious diseases after the COVID. And over the over seventy percent of the emerging infectious diseases are in in humans are zoonotic from origin. 
uh, how can we better be better prepared for an inevitable future pandemic? And here is the uh, ERAS approach as an example, early recognition, rapid action to zoonotic uh, emergencies. And it is a kind of uh, circle uh, uh, from prevention to preparedness, to response, to recovery and learning, to prevention, preparedness, response, recovery and learning, et cetera, et cetera. The pandemic prevention is about uh, uh, in, in, in depth knowledge, in depth knowledge about emerging pathogens and global agri food systems, but it also uh, is in depth knowledge about the agri food system redesign, uh, uh, wildlife management, and biodiversity recovery in, uh, in connection to, uh, uh, to that and mapping the hotspots. Pandemic preparedness, secondly, in, in, in this chain is about uh, surveillance and action, uh, uh, early warning, rapid characterization of, of pathogens, uh, vaccine, vaccine uh, platforms that are ready to develop when uh, a new pathogen is being characterized and, uh, and is being seen, uh, uh, all based in contingency planning. Pandemic, the pandemic response management uh, uh, has to deal with uh, uh, successful outbreak control. It, it's, it's a little bit further away from the domain of uh, uh, animal research per se. It is about uh, interventions, uh, diagnostics, uh, community strategies and data collect, uh, collection. But in the recovery and learning, the last step of the four in the circle, actually the first step in the circle, in the new circle, the next circle, is to learn from uh, uh, what happened. And the, and, and, and the COVID-19 is of for sure uh, a, a, a showcase for research uh, to understand more better uh, the importance, uh, uh, the, 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 the strength of uh, agri-food system resilience. Uh, are we good enough in our One Health approach? Uh, uh, comes later also in this, uh, this seminar, in this webinar, I have to say. The next one is, is, is this one, uh, in, uh, in, in resilience. Actually, we can say uh, resilience is, uh, 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 is uh, circularity is trend setting. But circularity also comes along with uh, resilience, and I'm, I, will, I will try to uh, uh, exemplify that. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, the main driver for future sustainability in food production is a shift in focus from only production efficiency uh, uh, to a balance with resource efficiency by nature-based resource efficiency according to the principles of circularity in a food system that's optimally uh, embedded in, uh, in, in a nature-based uh, uh, society. It's, it's, it's this point. So this was the food system as it was, and this is the food system of the future, also uh, considered by the From Farm to Fork strategy, uh, uh, the, 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 the use, the reuse of, of residuals in the food system, in the bio-based society, as resourcing of, of, of the food system itself. And there it comes. Livestock is connecting the circular resources uh, by nature. Uh, um, uh, livestock can convert to much wider spectrum of, of non-food biomass as, as, as feed uh, into food. Uh, uh, the production of manure uh, high quality manure, uh, the high, uh, processing the manure to a high quality uh, uh, gives uh, uh, an alternative for uh, uh, inorganic uh, fertilization. And actually the carbon sequestration comes along with that and the biodiversity restoration comes along with that. Livestock in the food system is really needed to come up with resilient uh, food systems. And in the pandemic uh, uh, situation, as we experience now, we have seen how important a resilient food system is, how important circular 
circularity in the food system is. Actually, I'm quite proud to be leading a, a consortium of, of 20 living labs where uh, 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 restoring the biodiversity and ecosystem services in the agricultural landscape throughout uh, 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 across Europe is, is, is really uh, uh, there for uh, real for impact. But in all these living labs, the livestock production is part of, uh, of, of, of the story. And, and actually the livestock of the future is being characterized, will be characterized by a smart approach, adaptive eco-technological livestock diversity, diversity to uh, uh, adapt to the local circumstances, uh, diversity to increase the resilience uh, livestock to make sure that there is no waste in the food system and that uh, uh, livestock as champions of recycling are, uh, are part of that. But this means a more smart uh, deviation, diversification of uh, livestock and that also comes along with uh, uh, research questions. Actually, this is my already my last slide, so I think we have time uh, for a good uh, question and answer session. When I look at the Horizon Europe call that, that, that's just been launched for the, the, the call 2021 and 2022, you already see in that Horizon Europe call impact of the pandemic preparedness from pandemic preparedness up to the role of biodiversity and ecosystem services in, uh, in, in preventing uh, pandemics and epidemic risks uh, and up to animal disease ecology uh, to understand it uh, better. But also the resilience is, has a prominent role in, in, in this call with resilient livestock systems and the climate change and animal welfare 2.0 but also the microbiomes in the food production system and the microbiome of livestock is, 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 is one of the most important microbiomes in the food production system. And the agroecological approaches for resilient production and enhanced biodiversity. And also the smart part, the digitalization as an enabler for agroecological farming systems. I think this is not the same as the animal research that we know from the seven framework program that we know from the horizon 2020 program probably we already have seen it a little bit in the green deal call in in, in this year 2020 but this will be the main challenges for animal science for animal research in the COVID aftermath the COVID will be reflected in the research agenda as well so it's not impacting only our life our society, our economy, but also our daily work as animal scientists, as animal researchers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Martin. That was a very, very interesting talk. I think you have uh, highlighted the, the role the livestock sector can, can have in helping the world recover from the pandemic, but they are also facing, as you said, many other challenges. And I think uh, most of these programs uh, are addressing, if not in this first course, maybe uh, on some topics later, they will address uh, many issues concerned with the pandemic and preparedness. I think uh, what, what COVID-19 has uh, certainly uh, demonstrated was that science and international collaboration were essential for, for giving a response for treatments, vaccines, and so on. And it's uh, also true that it will be uh, the core of the response in the livestock sector. Um, uh, the discussion is open. If uh, someone from the audience has any question, If that's not the case, Martin, uh, uh, well, we have seen that um, uh, well, the Green Deal was uh, already almost there when the uh, when the outbreak of, of COVID-19 happened. But um, what's your perception? Can you elaborate on the kind of topics that you have seen change in response uh, to, to what has happened in the past year from what was 
expected that would be the first course to be to be launched it yeah I, I, I think what i see is that uh, uh, more and more the direction is towards uh, uh, a, a livestock uh, a production that is uh, part of a european food system uh, uh, to use the european resources uh, uh, for the food system and also to provide European uh, 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 products for the European market. I think uh, there is a tendency to become less globalized in, uh, in the agri-food uh, uh, business. So I think that's an important uh, point. And there you see the defi deviation of the interest for farmers and agribusiness. Actually, the agribusiness, the big agribusiness is, is, is global operating, is operating globally. Uh, mm -hmm. While the farmers are more and more uh, marginalized in the, in, in the global economy mm -hmm. and find its, its, its room in, in, in a more uh, uh, yeah, regional European economy uh, uh, with specific uh, 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 products. Uh, uh, also, the, uh, the, the 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 society asks farmers to come up with uh, more adaptive uh, uh, farm systems, uh, customized to the diversity that uh, the European landscape brings. And I, I see that reflected in, uh, in, in, the, in, in, in the research agenda. Actually, uh, the, the Green Deal call was already uh, uh, launched before the COVID came there. But uh, very soon you saw the impact of the COVID in uh, yeah, paying more attention to uh, 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 yeah, the preparedness of pandemics, uh, where comes the, uh, the viruses uh, are coming from wildlife. You need animal researchers to uh, understand that, to know that, to, to track that, to trace that. Uh, 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 but also, uh, um, yeah, a, 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 a more locally connected, a more diverse uh, 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 food system uh, also compared with, with animal production. Is, is, is really less sensitive for, uh, for pandemic uh, uh, risks, also not creating pandemic risk, uh, 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 so not the risk. So uh, yeah, the, the tendency is towards there, both from the society, from policy, and I, I, I see it from farmer side. And I see that the agribusiness will, uh, will, will follow this, uh, this, 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 this change in the market, but it is really a dis disruption. And I, I don't think the, the Horizon Europe uh, will uh, ever go back to uh, uh, the, the, the pre-COVID uh, period. It will always have this, this lessons learned from the COVID as, 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 as the guiding principles for setting up the next uh, research agenda. Well, it will be very good if we had le learned something from this. <laughs> And well, I think the, the approach is uh, the typical uh, thing global and not local. Uh, more and more, uh, the projects uh, mobilize um, different disciplines and they want to have different regions involved, different agroecosystems, different uh, farming systems, and uh, analyze how different responses can, can be delivered in, in each situation. Yeah. So um, I think we have a question here. Um, yeah, I see. It's uh, from Mohammed Abu Bakr. Yeah, I saw the question ah, of uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the question of uh, Mohammed uh, uh, happen having taken a curious uh, cursory look at, the, at, happen, at happenings globally in your uh, own perspective. What do you think livestock sector needs to do uh, to sustain its livestock value chains in this regard? Well, actually. I think what, 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 what is necessary for both the livestock sector as well as for the livestock scientists, the animal scientists, is to stress the importance of animals in a nature-based food system, in a circular food system, in a food system uh, that works with, uh, 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 um, in compliance with, with, with the capacity of our planet. Uh, uh, when we look at the natural ecosystems, there is no ecosystem without animals. 
animals are there to make sure that that the the, the cycle is is, the, is 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 closed. The circle of life is closed only by animals. That's in in real life nature. That is also in uh, uh, in the in the nature of the of the food systems, and it's it's by nature of our livestock species that are the champions in in recycling. Even when it's uh, the ruminants, the cattle, the, the goats, the sheep, but also uh, the, the 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 chickens and uh, and 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 the pigs that are originally there to uh, to cope with the uh, resources locally available. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's we we have to change from defending uh, uh, the uh, uh, opposition against livestock production. Uh, with all kind of arguments that it is not so bad as it is, but that we offense, that we bring the the, the positive story of uh, of livestock and 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 repeat and repeat again that that livestock is in the heart of a sustainable food system and that is a food system that is uh, 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 the, 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 without livestock is an amputated food system which is not as sustainable, not as efficient, not as resilient as a livestock system with, uh, as a food system with livestock. And I think that is an important message and also to prove it in, in, in practice, to to uh, 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 demonstrate it in uh, in experiments and to convince uh, 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 the society not to make the wrong choice. Uh, linear reduction of the number of animals will not end up in uh, in, in in sustainability, but a transformative change of how we are using our animals. Yeah, that's a point we can take up. The animal production as we have now built up over the last 60 years can be changed. We can be much more uh, making use or uh, making filling the uh, circularity gap uh, by uh, selection of other feeds and by better management of the manure. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Martin. We have a question. Well, it's on the same line from Jan Ledoux, who says that uh, it's good to see you put livestock at the heart of the agricultural systems. But do you see this continuing in spite of the increasing pressure of the implied uh, green, greenhouse gas emissions associated to ruminants? Yeah, very mm -hmm. good. I just had a, a discussion yeah. with BT Climate <laughs> <laughs> about this point, uh, uh, where we agreed to that that the. Uh, uh, that there is a lot to gain with uh, with mitigation uh, options, a uh, uh, better feed, uh, better breed, uh, uh, etc., etc. But there is there is an end on the story. What we can do with direct mitigation. But life, but circularity uh, in uh, in the food system is is really the next gain. The the the, the is 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 the the the, the missing uh, step between what we what we can reduce from a technical point of view to uh, climate neutrality. Uh, that means that, that most of the missions are related to uh, uh, residuals, to, to, to waste, to emissions are, are parts of, of, of what, what, what is wasted. The, the, the closer, the more smart we can connect the food system, uh, elements in the food system by circularity, the lower the uh, uh, emissions of uh, of uh, greenhouse gases uh, uh, will be, or actually better to say, the more carbon is being sequestered in an uh, agroecological ecosystem, uh, uh, and 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 yeah, the animals are needed for that. I I I have a very nice graph showing that we only can come come to that carbon neutrality uh, when we are. Uh, uh, using animal manure when we are using byproducts from from croplands uh, uh, to feed uh, animals when we are using uh, uh, our uh, 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 biomass residuals to uh, uh, feed uh, 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 either the soils or the animals and, and yeah that's that that's so great so yeah rumens produce methane 
but the capacity to uh, provide ecosystem services to, to, to enhance the carbon sequestration uh, can balance that out. And we have to look at a system, not just at one part of the total food system in a single uh, production uh, line. And uh, we have time for a final question from Melanie Giovanni, who asks if, if you foresee that there will be a kind of unglobalization for livestock farming and a more intense focus in local markets, and how can this system be financially viable? Yeah. Um... Uh, with another business uh, model than uh, uh, the, 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 the business model based on global trade of commodities. Actually, that is the, that's the story. The, the, the business on commodities is already marginal for, uh, uh, for farmers, for the direct uh, agribusiness. It is, uh, it's profitable for retailers, uh, uh, very close to the consumers, but it is not in the, in the production, uh, uh, in the upstream part of the, of the, 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 the food system. Uh, uh, when you can uh, cope with uh, a, a wider uh, spectrum of, of, of resources, the expenses to gather resources, the expenses to feed your animals uh, will be lower. When you're producing uh, byproducts that is resourcing for others, for instance, manure as fertilizer is uh, uh, providing uh, 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 extra uh, income. So the, the economic model has to be more scarce on what your uh, um, a more a wider range of resources makes you less dependent on a scarce resource that everybody use. So it makes you uh, able to cope with um, less expensive resources. And, 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 and the more, uh, the wider your production is, not only the single commodity, but also byproducts. Uh, uh, the better uh, uh, your business is, uh, is, is, is filled with that. So no waste means also no waste of money in, uh, in, in the farming system. So uh, uh, also that point, it, it's often said uh, it, it, uh, there is no earning in it. Uh, yeah, there is an earning, but you have to bring it in practice and you have to find another position in the market, more in the regional uh, 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 market. I'm, I'm not saying local to local. Eh? It's it's not per se uh, local to local. If you can do it, then it's fine. But uh, 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 as close by as possible, uh, as far uh, away as necessary, also from an economic point of view. Uh, but try to find it uh, uh, in uh, in uh, an economic uh, food system. Uh, that you oversee, and that's not depending on on the the the, uh, the the competitive rules of the global market and trade. That's that's a very interesting point of view. Thank you. So, Martin, we won't occupy more of your time. So, we thank you very much for for being able to be with with us today, despite. Uh, the busy afternoon that we know you have. Uh, thanks very much for a very interesting talk and hope to see you soon around. Okay, thank you, Isabel. Thank you. And goodbye and thank you all. Now we will move to our next speaker, who is uh, Christian Gortaza from the University, the University of Castilla-La Mancha in Spain. Christian is a veterinary with uh, uh, interest in ecology, and he works in the National Wildlife Research Institute, IREC, uh, where they deal with the conservation and man management of wildlife in their habitats. His expertise in wildlife epidemiology and disease control has resulted in a large number of grants and scientific publications as well as uh, his participation in several uh, teaching and mentoring programs. Um, Christian's research interests include viral, bacterial and parasitic diseases of wildlife and uh, their interac in their interaction with, with livestock. And he has an emphasis on zoonotic diseases such as uh, tuberculosis, which is uh, very important also in, in the case of livestock production. So, we will have now uh, Christian's talk. Oops, sorry.
Hi, everybody. This is Christian Cortazar from the IREC Institute, Universidad de Castilla-La Mancha in Spain, and I'm going to present on the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on animal health and farming. And this is the presentation outline. I will start with some context on animals and coronaviruses, and then deal with the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on animal health. Um, and finally, end up with uh, some outlook on what we can learn from other animal health crises and what uh, is going to happen. Uh, how long will it take to, to quit the pandemic? Um, coronaviruses mostly evolved in bats, and bats have a huge diversity of uh, species. Um, and also coronaviruses have a diversity of, of forms. There are alpha, beta, gamma, and so on, coronaviruses, the ones that we are more interested right now because of SARS is, of course, the beta coronaviruses. Um, and in fact, you can see there are uh, links between coronaviruses found in bats and coronaviruses found in human beings and uh, most likely there are also other uh, mammalian species involved as what we would call bridge hosts. How does it happen that coronaviruses jump over from their natural circulation in bad populations uh, to domestic animals or eventually to, to human beings? Well, essentially because we are getting closer together for different reasons, we are uh, increasing the probability of contact between bats, animals, and humans, and eventually this creates the right environment for host jumps to happen. And in fact, these kind of events have happened historically uh, quite often. It is estimated with molecular clock analysis that uh, uh, one human coronavirus already emerged in the year 1200. And there were other cases of emergence in uh, 1700, uh, in the 19th century, and several of them also during the 20th century. Uh, in the current century, since the year 2000, there have been uh, three relevant uh, uh, events. SARS coronavirus emerged in 2002, SARS-1, um, and this happened in uh, China and was mediated by a carnivorous mammal, probably the, the palm civet. Uh, in 2012, there was the emergence of MERS coronavirus, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. This uh, originated also from bats, but was mediated by a different bridge host, in this case, the dromedary camel. And, as you all know, quite recently, in 2019, uh, SARS coronavirus 2 emerged, in this case, in another part of China, spreading globally and originating the COVID-19 pandemic. And the rest of the story, you know it. So essentially, uh, this pandemic originated from a host jump uh, uh, that came from, from a bat, probably of the genus Rhinolophus, and most likely there was some mammalian bridge host involved. However, this bridge host is still unknown. And uh, this infection, uh, unfortunately, spread, once it jumped into the human population, it spread globally. Now, what is the effect of this pandemic on animal farming? 
well obviously it had effects on all aspects you can imagine and one of them is animal transport and the production input availability um, even in some countries meat processing plants had to be shut down because of the frequent transmission events in these uh, cold and closed environments um, and this created a huge pressure on the pig and poultry industries also there have been effects on animal care and welfare uh, because of the lockdown because of the sanitary rules and so on and this will uh, these aspects will be presented in other uh, parts of this webinar I am dealing in this one with the animal health aspect and the animal health aspect will cover both the short-term and the long-term effect what is the effect of COVID-19 on animal health well first of all there are several drivers on one side there is the immediate driver which is human confinement and inactivity this has some effect on animal populations and this may have an effect on animal health on the other side there are long-term drivers that we are still suffering and will keep on suffering for a number of years unfortunately and this is mainly the economic crisis and these drivers have their consequences and the consequences are on one side implications of coronavirus infections for farm animals on the other side there is less control of endemic diseases and there may also be a weaker response to new and emerging diseases so you can see the impact is a multifaceted one so if we take one disease as an example in this case bovine tuberculosis we may find both short-term and long-term effects regarding the short-term effect the effects of the lockdown and uh, uh, the lower presence of people in the environment so to say this has consequences like having more wildlife on farm premises and more importantly a consequence in form of an interruption of TB testing or at least a relaxation of TB testing and of course both are uh, driving risks towards eventually finding more TB breakdowns the main effect however is to be expected in the long term and this one is because of the economic crisis this will mean re less resources for TB testing it also will mean insufficient wildlife reservoir control because this is also resource dependent there will be possibly less investment in farm biosafety and there may be even lower vaccine coverage and parasite control and so a poorer health status of the animals by different mechanisms at the end you get to the same uh, outcome which is more TB breakdowns well this is just a supposed pathway of possible consequences and possible mechanisms uh, intervening uh, regarding animal health and COVID-19 mm. however some of uh, these discussions are already visible for instance there are a couple of papers in the veterinary record uh, um, stating that there are some challenges for keeping the appropriate social distance uh, while TB testing particularly in young cattle and therefore it has been established that calves under a certain age can eventually not be tested uh, in order to, to keep on with the rules of COVID-19 social distancing so you see there starts to be some unfortunately in the case of TB 
There is experience from a previous crisis, food and mouth disease. When food and mouth disease occurred in the UK in 2001, it had a huge effect on TB control. This was because of the uh, uh, draining of all the veterinary capacities to food and mouth control and therefore relaxing, obviously, the control of TB, of the ongoing uh, endemic disease TB. And you can see there between the red lines that the number of tests went down spectacularly during food and mouth and then after food and mouth in the upper graph you see there was a tremendous jump in the number of uh, new herd incidents. So a crisis, in that case an animal disease crisis, nothing to do with tuberculosis, uh, caused a change in tuberculosis epidemiology because of the effects on uh, uh, TB testing. Another example is emerging and transboundary diseases. For instance, there is now a uh, effort, an international effort ongoing to control and to try to eradicate Peste de Petit Ruminant. Uh, this is a uh, morbillivirus uh, that is present in many parts of the world, including many areas of Africa. Uh, however, one of the problems in the fight against PPR is precisely the COVID-19 pandemic, as stated in a recent report by FAO. And it is not only PPR, it is also other emerging diseases like lumpy skin disease. This seems to be expanding and in, in part this seems to be due to the economic effect of the COVID-19 pandemic. Also, regarding human emerging diseases, it happens that in 2020 there was a re-emergence of MERS in Saudi Arabia, infecting 18 people with five deaths. And this went rather unnoticed due to the global COVID-19 crisis. There are also some positive news. For instance, in Japan, a new assessment on the risk of ASF introduction, African swine fever introduction, calculated that due to reduced travel and the associated risks, there was a lower risk of ASF introduction into Japan. Now let's have a look at the animals themselves, at farmed animals. And the worst case scenario is the one affecting mink. In the case of mink, you can see there are uh, jumps from humans to mink from mink back to humans. Um, and this is an exceptional situation that is not repeating itself for the moment with any other animal species. As a consequence, uh, mink farming is going to be stopped in some countries, like for instance, the Netherlands and Denmark. Now the important point is that when the virus jumps from one host, in this case from a human host to an animal host and back to the human host, the virus will change because of adaptation. And some of these changes may eventually be more successful and may become one of those variants of concern. Fortunately, this was not the case in the mink farming uh, uh, event, but it may eventually happen in the future in any other similar situation. Also, other mustelids, notably ferrets, can be found infected. However, their lower population size means that the risks associated with mutation is generally lower than in the case of mink. What about other farm animals? Cattle do get infected but fortunately do not transmit the virus to in-contact animals. And pigs seem not susceptible. However, we know nothing about sheep and goat, 
and we know that rabbits do get infected. And always, in this field, you need to expect the unexpected. Um, in this experiment, that is still uh, not uh, formally published, but available already as a preprint by colleagues from the USDA, um, you can see that they infected white-tailed deer, a cervid species. And the interesting point is that they managed to show that there was transmission from deer to deer. So eventually, deer, like mink, may maintain uh, virus circulation in their populations, at least under the conditions of this specific virus. Another long-term potential consequence of COVID-19 on animal health and animal production is a more far-reaching one. It is known that the emergence of pathogens has to do with interspecies contact and this interspecies contact is essentially mediated by large-scale changes in climate, in uh, land use and very especially in animal management. Therefore, there is this other kind of effect that may be due to change in the public attitudes towards livestock production and wildlife use. Now coming slowly to the end of the presentation, I think there are lots of aspects where we can learn from veterinary science. For instance, from the success of rinderpest eradication, where there was a combination of research efforts in vaccine development and in epidemiology, including the development of a thermostable vaccine, but then there was also a application of participatory epidemiological techniques allowing vets to interact with the cattle herders to effectively target the control measures. So not only knowing what works, but also being able to transmit it and to apply it appropriately. Uh, when I see this, I think, for instance, of the long discussion on aerosol transmission of uh, SARS coronavirus 2. There are more things that we can learn from veterinary science. For instance, back to the foot and mouth disease, there are many things like preclinical viral transmission, uh, early detection, lockdowns, biosecurity, shortage of testing capacity, and so on, that are uh, in common with some of the problems that we faced as a population with COVID-19. Um, for instance, choosing some of the lessons to be learned, I would particularly point at ensuring that outbreaks do not become epidemics, including the need to consider national lockdown. This was already discussed after the foot and mouth disease crisis in the UK. There is also the point of the need for rapid testing and reporting, including point of care tests. And in many European countries, point of care tests, particularly antigen tests, are still not freely available for the public. Also, there was a point that scientific experts must be accountable not only to government ministers, but also to other experts. And this reminds me very much of the discussions we had in Spain regarding the fake scientific committee uh, advising the government on, during the COVID-19 crisis. More things we can learn. We can look into coronaviruses in animals, for instance, into the porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, a coronavirus, that is emerging and re-emerging, and that traveled from one point to the other of the world, that mutated and changed 
uh, and then went back to the origin and so on. Uh, you know, even learn from chicken because in chicken coronaviruses are one of the big problems in animal production and things like lockdowns, movement controls, uh, vaccination are usual tools for the veterinary sector. And even more can we learn from veterinary science. For instance, there is a lot of background on using vaccines against coronaviruses in uh, dogs, in cats, in bovines, in swine, uh, and in birds. And uh, there have been many different uh, uh, routes of administration, vaccine types, and so on. Uh, all this gives relevant information that is not always properly used in the context of the pandemic. So now to the final point. How long will this pandemic still last? Well, we don't know, but you are, you are all aware of what is happening in uh, Brazil, uh, especially, especially in Manaus, where 70% of the population had already antibodies or had had contact with the virus. So there was, in principle, a herd immunity level. And then a new lineage, a new variant emerged and essentially provoked a second wave that was even uh, harder than the first one. This is obviously a uh, game changer. And even if you look globally, we were happy enough to see during six weeks in a row a decline globally in the number of cases of, of new cases of COVID-19. However, the trend has changed. And after six weeks declining, in the last week where there are data, the trend has reversed already. And this reversal of the trend is probably to do with the more transmissible new variants. What is happening? Well, essentially, uh, with our social distancing, uh, confinement, masks, and so on, um, natural selection will make it that the more transmissible viruses will survive best and will uh, 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 multiply. Then we use vaccines and we target herd immunity. But then again, natural selection will uh, select for variants that are able to escape antigenically. What can we do then? Well, we need a very good surveillance, monitoring, including sequencing. We need to improve detection, more accessible antigen tests. We need to reduce transmission, especially taking care of aerosols and quality masks. And we need to uh, work on vaccination, of course. And we need probably to learn with, with the virus. So is this going to stay for long? We don't know, but my guess is it will become endemic despite vaccines, because of virus variants of concern, and maybe also because of animal reservoirs. And there we come back to uh, the aspects of animal health and their relevance in the whole context of COVID-19. And with this, I'm almost finishing the presentation with the following three take home messages. First one, global change and pathogen spread are going to carry on. We don't know which is the next pandemic and when it will happen, but we can be absolutely sure it will happen and it will most likely come from the animal world. Therefore, it seems uh, clever to involve vets and animal specialists in the fight against emerging infections, not just against COVID-19, but against emerging infections in general. And on the practical side, and taking into account we are entering a long economic crisis because of this pandemic, we urgently need to adapt animal health management strategies, both at the farm level and at the national and the international one, 
to the available resources. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Christian. It was a very challenging talk. Thanks for highlighting the very important role of the interface between wildlife, livestock, and humans, and also for highlighting the lessons we can learn from the from the veterinary expertise on epidemiology. I think it's uh, what you have uh, said today is is very important and could be very helpful. Um, before we have some questions on the chat, if someone wants to pose a question, I'd like to know, are you aware of any uh, surveillance that system that has been established either at a national or a transnational level to um, um, assess the, the infections of COVID on wildlife? Because we have seen that it can affect mink and even rabbits, and we don't know if it can affect sheep and goat. But uh, if it can affect these animals, it can certainly affect other um, mustelids or the uh, wild mammals, and they can they could be the bridge host that you said was missing. Are, are you aware of any kind of uh, system for for surveilling this? Um, thank you. First of all, thank you, Isabel, and, and the whole organization for inviting me to give this presentation. And uh, regarding surveillance in animals, uh, I guess there are there are two uh, situations: the academic research one, and the the government more more formal one. Okay, regarding the academic one, I guess everybody in the big groups is now looking at animals just in case because whatever comes out is very relevant, is very interesting, and this is uh, at the at the very edge of what we know. Uh, but uh, on the on the formal, uh, more official side. Uh, the only group of animals that is currently of concern is farm mink and other farm mustelids because they have very large populations and because there is the only situation where it has been shown that the virus can enter from human beings, obviously, uh, circulate and eventually turn back to humans, eventually changing on the way. And this is, of course, a risk because there may be uh, that may be a me mechanism for the emergence of new variants or whatsoever. Uh, in uh, other mustelids, including wildlife, um, there is a recommendation to, to pay attention to them, to, to investigate, but it is pretty unlikely to find something that is very relevant because mustelids do not form large populations that uh, would allow the circulation of the virus. I would be more interested in other situations of other wildlife that may have larger populations where eventually something of interest might, might happen. But uh, I think this part is, is staying for the moment more on the research side of things rather than on the official one. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And uh, you have also presented some ideas that we could uh, extract for the, for the experience that we veterinarians have had with, uh, with other diseases, but also with coronaviruses. We have seen what well, you have uh, illustrated how the different diseases, either classical or re-emerging are interconnected and how they are affected by COVID-19, if not uh, directly, because it doesn't directly affect uh, the animals because of the reduces, uh, reduced resources to the, to the control of these diseases. But uh, could you elaborate on some other things that could, could be extracted from, from the veterinary experience? I mean, we have been vaccinating our animals against coronavirus, coronavirus for a long time. And uh, we know that it, uh, immunity regarding coronavirus is not uh, easy to handle. Uh, do you think we can learn something for, for the future vaccines, which obviously are very different from those we are using in, in animals, in livestock? Mm -hmm. That's a long question <laughs> with a lot, of, a lot of different angles. I, mm -hmm. I, in a very broad uh, uh, sense, I would say that uh, as vets and particularly as people working in the field of, of uh, livestock breeding and animal science, we are very used to deal with populations and to handle the disease at the population scale. Uh, and therefore, we are pretty used to things like biosafety, like confinement, like movement control, obviously like ma mass vaccination, uh, mass testing, all these kind of tools that are now on the table because of COVID-19. And I have the impression that in some cases, 
the national health services, at least in certain countries and certainly here in Spain, were no longer used to deal with population uh, dynamics and uh, 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 epidemiology at the population scale. They were more used to uh, the, the individual medicine approach, which is fine, of course. But the epidemiology side has shown a strong weakness. And in this aspect is where I think that uh, uh, authorities should have taken more advantage of uh, the existing knowledge in the veterinary field. Um, and then, uh, well, there are so many other specific aspects where, where things could be done and, and research is certainly needed, but, but that's uh, too broad probably for a, for a short answer here. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks. If anyone wants to, to ask a question, please. If uh, that's not the case, we'll have a short break now and we will come back at, um, I think it will be um, half past three and we will follow with our, with our webinar. We have now a, a, couple, a couple of presentations left and then we will have a general discussion. So. Uh, please come back with us at uh, half past half past three. And in the meanwhile, I'm going to share with you not only the program of uh, today's webinar, but also the one that we will have uh, uh, at the end of March. Oh, sorry. Which is this one uh, that has been prepared by the EAP Insect Scientific Commission. So uh, please come back in a quarter of an hour and we'll go on with this webinar on the impacts of COVID-19 of livestock. Thank you very much.
Well, we are back again with our uh, EAP webinar on the effects of uh, COVID-19 on livestock on the livestock sector. And thanks for being back with us. Our next speaker will be Laura Boyle. Laura is a senior researcher at uh, uh, TIGASC in Ireland, and she is an expert in farm animal behavior and welfare science. Laura is also a member of the European College of Animal Welfare and Behavioral Medici Medicine and a recognized advisor for the European Food Safety Authority and also for several national uh, Irish committees. She has a large scientific production and has participated in numerous farm animal welfare programs, uh, most of the projects concerning the effects of housing and management practices on the welfare of dairy cows and pigs. Laura is also interested in the link between animal health and animal welfare and in the contribution they can make to the sustainability of animal agriculture. In 2019, she was awarded by the British Society and Animal Science and the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals for her innovative developments in animal welfare. She is also a very active EAP member because she, she is the current chair of the Animal Behavior Working Group and she has been secretary to our Animal Health and Welfare Scientific Commun uh, Commission. The title of Laura's presentation is the impact of COVID-19 on animal uh, health and welfare. Uh, uh, it's a, a one fair Sorry, a one welfare issue. So we will now have Laura's um, presentation. If I can share my screen. Thank you very much for the introduction. So let me introduce the topic by first exploring the prominent role that animals played in our lives during the past year. So I, like thousands of people across the world, adopted a dog early on into lockdown last year and he brought us lots of love and fun as I hope we brought into his life. However, the welfare of our pets was also adversely affected, firstly by the fact or the fear that, that our pets would make us sick with coronavirus and this led to pets being abandoned and of course, adopting a puppy, a puppy is for life, not just for a pandemic. Um, and lots of animals were, again, you know, given up to uh, shelter homes when the pandemic puppy didn't work out. There were other issues such as an increase in dog bites because of the, the increased and prolonged proximity, I suppose, between children and pets in the home. And this led to, this has led to a huge surge in um, this and other issues have led to a huge surge in the number of um, relinquished and abandoned animals. Um, this report is from American um, Pet Shelters. So coronavirus also had implications for wild and zoo animals. There were concerns that some endangered species like the mountain gorillas would become infected by coronavirus. And there were reports of zoo animals like the gorillas here in San Diego Zoo contracting coronavirus. There were fears for the welfare of zoo animals and other animals in captivity because of reduction in revenue during the pandemic. And there was fundraising for, um, for many zoos around the world. Some zoo anim animals benefited from the reduction in visitors because they um, showed behavioral changes and, and used more of their enclosures during this time. And of course, it seemed like the whole world was watching Tiger King from, from our own enclosures. And I think our, the lockdown helped us to empathise a little bit more with, with the plight of, of such animals. So obviously one of the animals that featured really highly all year um, has been bats. And this is because they were being sold in the wet markets in Wuhan for human consumption. And it is, it is believed, well one theory is that the wet markets launched the coronavirus. There's a lot of debate about this, a lot of conspiracy theories. But certainly there, that there, there may have been some role here. And indeed, even in a very recent publication, SARS-CoV-2 was detected in bats in, as far away from China as um, caves in, down in, China, in Thailand. So we all know, of course, how, how poorly um, thought of bats are and the fear and the misconceptions surrounding them. We only have to think of 
of Dracula to see, to, to, to know how badly represented they are and how maligned they are, if you like. So ecologists are fighting back to shift the blame from bats. There are many papers showing how anthropogenic induced climate change has brought bats into closer contact with humans, therefore facilitating the transmission of disease. And to emphasize the insectivorous and therefore beneficial attributes of bats in pest control. So it's estimated they save US crops from about $3.6 billion worth of damage every year. So this has led authors like in this paper, Lou et al, to stress the importance of a One Health approach in enforcing public health guidelines. This is in relation to another zoonotic disease, rabies, but it could equally apply to um, coronavirus. So really what I wanted to do and what I've done in the past few slides is to emphasize how connected our mental and physical well-being is to animals and through animals to our environment. And this is really um, emphasized by what we all know as the One, the one Health approach. And, and One Health is about the collaborative efforts of multiple disciplines working locally, nationally and globally to attain optimal health for people, animals and the environment. And I did a quick um, search on Google looking for the, the One Health um, and coronavirus together and found nearly 11 and a half thousand articles really advocating a One Health approach um, to this uh, pandemic, to pandemic and to prevent future pa pandemics. So, so papers like this in, in the One Health journal. Of course, the topic of this talk is, is One Welfare and One Welfare extends the concept of One Health to emphasize the interconnectedness of the welfare of humans, animals and the environment in which they live. And is therefore, if you consider that health is a component of welfare, perhaps arguably a more holistic concept. But when I searched um, for, for one welfare in conjunction with coronavirus or COVID-19 in Google Scholar, there were only about 140 articles. And so it is a much less well-known concept. And I'll just direct you to one very recent paper in Applied Animal Behaviour Science um, about one welfare, if you want to read more about the concept and the framework in general. It's written by Rebecca Garcia, who is actually the founder of the One Health, One Welfare Site concept. So now let's move on to species and animals that are closer to, to, to all of us here and um, farmed animals. But I do want to start by talking about mink. So mink might not come to mind when we talk about farm animals, but there are 35 million of them farmed for fur in the EU. And I guess we'll all know that there were about 17 million mink culled in, in, in Denmark, but also in many other countries around Europe and the world. So if we talk about the mink cull in terms of one welfare, then we had the fact that they were, they were culled, obviously, because they posed um, a risk not only to, to human welfare, but also to wildlife, so animals there. And of course, mink themselves died because of coronavirus. In the United States, saw that more than 12,000 of the country's 3 million farmed mink actually died from coronavirus. And there were other issues um, surrounding the mink cull related to animal welfare. And there were fears that gassing is a, is a cruel way to kill mink. This is a um, com commonly held conception. Because they are semi-aquatic animals, they're able to hold their breath for long periods. Moving back to the welfare of humans and how the mink cull hit on human well-being, this picture shows uh, mink farmers in Denmark lowering their mask, their flag to half mast on the day that they had to kill 250,000 of their animals. So it was a huge psychological toll um, on people who lost their livelihoods and on the simple act of having to kill all those animals. Of course, killing them and disposal of the bodies posed a huge environmental threat and in Denmark millions of, of, of mink were exhumed over pollution controls. So the mink call really just um, is a nice example of, of how the One Welfare framework um, works. But for the next few slides I want to focus on a paper that I wrote with Jeremy Marchant last year where we looked at the effects on livestock production in terms of One Welfare and we focused on pigs and poultry. So you'll all be very familiar with intensive pig and poultry production sectors, but obviously there are very few large farms with large numbers of animals. They're enclosed, climate controlled and automated. 
characterized usually by very few stock persons, but, but most importantly, they operate at maximal output or full capacity always. This means the immediate impact of any disruption is felt up and downstream. So let's look first of all at some of the short term effects of COVID-19 on the supply chains. So there were many jokes going around about panic buying of toilet roll, but there were also panic buying of animal products such as eggs, cheese and milk. There was an increase in meals prepared at home and a reduction in meals eaten out. So there was, there's two streams of supply of the food service industry versus supermarkets and there was a huge re readjustment in, in these two supply chains. Because of the closure of schools in the US, there was about a 12-15% reduction in the demand for dairy, meaning that US dairy farmers had to dump mink, or milk sorry, as, pandemic, as the pandemic upended food markets. But there was also milk dumping in other countries because of reduced processing capacity. Um, the whole egg demand went up with, with the increase in people preparing foods at home and the demand for liquid egg went down. And this led to the closure indeed of a liquid egg plant and um, which resulted in uh, 61,000 chickens being euthanized um, in the US again. But it was really the COVID-19 outbreaks in meat plants that have featured very strongly all year and that really have, have happened in almost every country in the world. But at the time of writing the paper, the time of publication of the paper in September, the US was definitely the worst hit country. At that stage, they had 40,000 cases um, in over 400 plants um, associated with 49 shutdowns. But as I said, you know, there's hardly a country that's been untouched by this. Um, another um, industry was, was Tani's in, in Germany that was ordered to shut after coronavirus outbreak later in the year last year, it was around July or, or August. And this headline comes from an Irish newspaper only a week or two ago, which um, was um, advocating shutdown of meat plants because um, of the ongoing outbreaks in such plants. So to counteract some of these shutdowns, the USDA um, issued line speed waivers. This was in terms of, this was for the poultry plants, and it meant that there was an increase in the number of birds per minute on the line from 140 to 175 birds. And this has some implications in some of the slides I'm going to cover next. So let's talk a little bit about the outbreaks of COVID in the meat plants and the effects and the implications for human well-being. So obviously anyone who is sick with COVID, their health and welfare is down and, and the people who, who contracted COVID in the meat plants were obviously sick and had poor welfare. But what these outbreaks really reveal were enormous inequality issues. So we know that in meat plants all around the world, they're mostly operated by migrant and minority workers. And such people are um, outside of, of any um, occupation that they do at greater risk of COVID. They have language barriers and poor working conditions because in most meat plants, it's food safety and zoonotic disease that dictates hygiene practices rather than the transfer of disease between humans. So all of these issues really place workers in meat plants at increased risk of coronavirus. And there are other complications associated with working in meat plants. There's a lot of animal equipment and assault related injuries, psychological stress and drug use. And generally the people who work there are poorly paid in some countries have poor health care and lack of sick leave. And they live in high density and low quality. So the plant workers obviously also face financial uncertainty and job losses and their workloads and duties may have changed. So with people missing from the line and out sick and people were put doing work perhaps that they weren't accustomed to, which could have also increased the injury and stress. But the plant shutdowns obviously also had implications for farmers because they suffered financial losses. We saw um, about the mink farmers in Denmark in, in an earlier slide. And there's a huge cost associated with depopulation, which we already touched on. But even the euthanasia of single animals, individual animals on farms is a major barrier towards the euthanasia of, 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 of compromised or casualty animals. But when it comes to mass depopulation, and this picture comes from the foot and mouth um, crisis in, in the UK in the 90s, um, and we know that the people involved in this suffered years of um, 
distress and disorders following uh, this depopulation. There are also threats to public health associated with food safety and carcass disposal um, can cause a pathogen release, pose odour and nuisance insects, which are all um, obviously cause problems for public health. Moving on then to the for farm animals. So this loss in processing capacity affected all species. And you can see this graph taken from the paper shows a reduction in processing capacity for poultry, cattle and pigs. But of course, um, the poultry and pig industries were more severely affected. So in April 2020 in the US, it was estimated that slaughter capacity was down to about 55% of normal. This meant that about 250,000 pigs were reaching slaughter weight every day without anywhere to go. So in, in April, President Trump did issue an executive order to reopen and by May 19th, the plants were up to about 80% of capacity. But this, this still meant that there was about 100,000 pigs a day reaching slaughter weight without anywhere to kill them. In the poultry plants, the increased line speeds that I mentioned earlier did recapture some of the loss in capacity. So focusing for a little bit on poultry welfare then, these line speed waivers could um, result in incomplete stunning, which would obviously have negative implications for poultry welfare. So we know that broilers grow at very fast rates, which means they become overcrowded very quickly if there's nowhere for them to be slaughtered. And under high stocking densities, poultry um, suffer a lot of welfare problems, including reduced walking ability and leg health, increased fearfulness, foot pad dermatitis and mortality. There's also an increase in heat production, which would re reduce air and bedding quality. One way of addressing this is to stop placing eggs for incubation, and this would have an effect on bird numbers within three weeks. Another option is to destroy eggs or kill chicks at hatching, which um, takes a little bit longer to adjust the numbers, perhaps about two months. But we know that there's already enormous welfare, ethical and societal concerns around the routine um, killing of day old male chicks. And many countries have moved to ban this, pro this pro um, procedure. So um, these all have implications. When it comes to pigs, I suppose they, there is a little bit more resilience um, compared to the poultry chains, but they still grow very quickly and can become overcrowded very quickly. And at high stocking de densities, you get a reduction in activity and comfort behaviour and leg health, similar to poultry. Of course, with pigs, under high stocking densities, you get a huge increase in aggression, skin injuries, tail biting and susceptibility to disease a reduction in performance and increase it also in heat production and therefore reduction in air, qu air quality. Mitigation strategies in the US where they feed growth from waters, they could remove them from the diet and in a way this would have um, potential positives for pig welfare. Other countries designed holding diets which <clears throat> are lower in energy and higher in fibre and have the effect of reducing feed intake. But this can affect the um, the effective state of pigs by increasing the feelings of hunger, which would be associated with an increase in aggression. Another way is to simply reduce feed availability to pigs, but obviously this will make them hungry and likely to be more aggressive. Another method is to increase the temperature in the buildings, which will increase heat stress. And stopping breeding and inducing abortions, the latter would also have obviously ethical implications. So the worst case scenario is obviously where animals have to be killed en masse. And ideally this would be by euthanasia, whereby animals have a good death without pain or distress. At the very least, emergency killing should observe the same level of welfare as during slaughter. And this means minimal handling, immediate death, sedation followed by death, or death while unconscious or stunned. But really, this is very difficult to achieve at scale. And we'll all have seen some of the images from Asia where animals were buried alive um, in response to the African swine fever outbreaks. And this is obviously very distressing for the animals and the humans involved. 
So risks to animal welfare associated with handling, the stun kill quality and confirmation of death disposal. So we don't know exactly, I don't know exactly as of today, how many pigs have been killed in the, in, in the US or around the world, but certainly as per September 2020, 600,000 pigs had been killed in Iowa State alone and up to 10 million birds across the US had had to be um, <clears throat> emergency killed. And the guidelines that would cover these um, emergency killings are in the US, the AVMA, in conjunction with the National Health Animal Health Emergency Management System. And in the EU, there were two recent um, scientific opinions published by EFSA, one on killing for purposes other than slaughter in poultry in 2019. And more recently, last year, in fact, in June, the welfare of killed pigs during killing for purposes other than slaughter. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the methods that were advocated then for pigs include electrical, mechanical, so um, that could be blunt trauma or captive bolt, gas mixtures and lethal injection. Obviously the chosen method depends on the size or age of the pig. The AF AVMA also include ventilation shutdown and ventilation shutdown plus heat or carbon dioxide, which is known as VSD plus. In poultry, the methods of euthanasia or mass emergency killing depend on the production system, be it floor, cage or aviary, and some of the methods include water-based foam, whole partial house or containerized gassing, cervical dislocation, mechanically assisted cervical dislocation, decapitation and captive bolt gun. The method of choice in the US was actually whole, whole house gassing with water-based foam methods. And it should be noted that the OIE does not condone the use of water-based foam methods, even in emergency situations. So from the two EFSA reports, the implications for animal welfare of mass emergency killing, they identified 29 hazards to poultry and 28 to pigs, mostly related to the stun and kill quality, but also to lack of staff skills and training and poorly designed and constructed facilities. With poultry, there are fears about insufficient time of exposure, say, to the gases and then this timing of ventilation shutdown. So ventilation shutdown, the pigs are supposed to be, or the poultry or pigs are supposed to be unconscious and the, um, they're not supposed to die of thermal stress, but in fact, there are concerns that sometimes they do. We don't need to do too much research to imagine the potential negative impacts of all of these methods of, of disposal on animal welfare. But at minimum, they're likely to cause enormous pain, fear, impede movement, and also potential respiratory disease. Another area that was affected was animal transport. So anytime animal transportation time is increased, you're going to get an increase in transport stress. Where plants shut down and animals had to be moved longer distances to alternative slaughter plants, obviously they will then experience increased transport stress. But there were also restrictions in movement between countries. So when the new variant was detected, uh, coronavirus variant was detected in the UK, um, a lot of countries shut their borders and there were seven and eight hour tailbacks on the uh, UK motorways and um, across the channel in France indeed, and it's not inconceivable that there were animals tied up in those um, backlogs. So Baptiste Etel wrote about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the welfare of animals in Australia, and they outlined another interesting um, scenario that happened where, whereby um, the Al Kuwait livestock ship arrived in Western Australia with a lot of the crew sick, such that it couldn't and load its, its, its stock of sheep and, and head away again. They, they had to wait for the crew recovered. And by the time they'd all recovered, they'd entered the, uh, the month of June. And there is a Northern summer order, which is that animals cannot be transported during the summer because of the uh, potential for heat stress. But the Australian government revoked this order and allowed the ship to carry its stock of 50,000 sheep and obviously this provoked enormous outrage from, from animal welfare and animal, um, animal welfare charities. There are ongoing cold sow issues associated with the coronavirus and certainly in Ireland these relate still to, to tonnies in, in Germany. 
And when you see the figures, it's quite incredible. From from Belgium and the Netherlands, 60,000 sows go every week to Germany for, for processing. And in Ireland, almost half of our gold sows go to Tony's for processing. The UK had a double whammy of Brexit and COVID, and there's a huge reduction in cold sow value. And all of this is um, still causing, certainly in Ireland, at least a backlog of cold sows on farms. <clears throat> so many, many years ago, I documented poor welfare of cold sows. And in more recent years, Meta Herskin and colleagues in Aarhus have done some work with cold sows. And we know these animals having low value um, under nor normal circumstances even, are very susceptible to poor welfare and deterioration in their welfare, um, both on the farm, but especially from the, po the point of departure to the farm until arrival at the slaughter plant. So this is an ongoing concern for the welfare of these animals. Finally, we go to the threat to the environment caused by pollution and any time carcasses are disposed of it poses a pollution risk because of the leaching of bodily fluids, chemicals um, into the environment and also hazardous gases and the potential for air surface and groundwater contamination. Obviously it will depend on the disposal method where you have unlined burial and composting as is allowed in the US, not in the EU, um, the risks are higher in the EU, um, if this occurs, it has to be done using um, lined methods. This picture shows the, the mink in, in Denmark, but we know then the problem was that they had to be exhumed and incinerated. And indeed incineration and rendering is probably a preferred option, but it's very energy costly and does release grease greenhouse. Areas where pig and poultry industries are concentrated already carry a burden of pollution. So the disposal of carcasses can um, cause a new stream of pollution in these areas. For example, the runoff from dead chicken compost is very high in phosphorus, much higher in fact than the phosphorus content of manure. Um, burial of, of animals causes risks to wildlife. Milk actually is a very high biochem biochemical oxygen um, demand, so um, it poses a risk to the environment. And another maybe less obvious issue is um, in the US, some dairy producers were advised to, to, to uh, cull more animals. And we know that involuntary culling is associated with an increase in In our paper, we also outlined some short-term solutions. So relating to production, there's definitely a need for research on alternative methods of math, mass euthanasia and disposal of animals. Mobile incineration units could, could help dispose of, of animals under such situations. At the processing level, processors could open for longer, I suppose, and you'll get a huge increase in processing capacity, but this isn't really a sustainable option. Local or mobile abattoirs are promising. There's been a huge reduction in, in local or smaller abattoirs. We know the industry has become hugely centralised and a lot of it is because of um, really burgeoning food safety requirements and the cost of implementing them for small scale abattoirs is really not sustainable. But we know that these local or mobile abattoirs do offer one welfare benefits in this paper outlined improvements in meat quality and um, to stress levels in lambs being slaughtered in a mobile. So other short term solutions are at the level of retail. There was an increase in direct to consumer retail models, so sale of food at farmers markets, sale of slow food or local produce, but obviously this would only have a small impact. In terms of consumption, some of the initial changes would indicate one welfare benefits. There was an increase in home prepared meals, which is good for the welfare of humans. And there was an increase in plant-based meat alternatives. I realize this is controversial, but um, such products are associated perhaps with lower greenhouse gas emissions, but on the other hand are also highly processed and therefore perhaps not the best for human beings. A better diet is possibly one that is um, high in unprocessed plant-based foods, but also involves some meats, such as, for example, the Mediterranean diet. And this would have a lower environmental footprint. And there's lots of evidence to show that it's much healthier for human beings. In the long term, though, obviously, 
there has to be policy change. And we've seen how Germany has reacted to the um, enormous upheaval caused by the COVID outbreaks in their meat slaughter plants, such that they are committed to reforming the meat industry. Sustainable intensification is being talked about a lot, and there's a lot of people here that would know a lot more about it than, than me, but it does seem imperative on us that we need to start um, re-evaluating how we produce livestock. Moderating our demand for animal products, as I've alluded to in the last slide, would seem to be part of this, and Colin Sage has written about sustainable consumption. Reducing food waste is obviously another hugely important component of this. There is an increase in alternative production systems, and it would seem that the UN Sustainable Development Goals, as well as the EU's Farm to Fork strategy, which requires a fair, healthy and environmentally friendly food system, is looking for alternative production systems. Um, regenerative agriculture is growing in popularity, and this is the title of a book, A Farm Girl's Search for the Promise of Regenerative Agriculture. But as she concedes, one size fits none, and the solution is likely going to have to come from a range of um, areas. Silvopastoral systems um, offer high biodiversity and good animal welfare for animals. And these authors talked about how they provide efficient feed conversion, enhanced connectivity between habitat patches, as well as animal welfare, and therefore they truly meet the one welfare requirements. But on the extreme, then you can have very high tech um, production systems, such as this is the, the Kipster farm, and they are able to produce very profitable um, eggs and a very profitable business model but it's also a carbon neutral model, so environmentally friendly. And the farm has won, won awards from Compassion World Farming and Eurogroup for Animals for the high standards of animal welfare. So this system also quite different from silvopastoral, but also offers huge one welfare. So what you've seen in the past few slides are all the one welfare problems that this pandemic has created. And our thesis is that we therefore need a one welfare solution. And animal welfare should probably be central to any one welfare solution because it's our connection to other animals, as we talked about throughout this presentation, that really inspires our concerns and connection to um, the environment. Animal welfare, because it is um, central to animal health, is a very powerful preventative medicine, and this is very important in an era of antimicrobial resistance. Also, animal welfare can, improving animal welfare, can mitigate um, greenhouse gas emissions and probably even better than breeding strategies and without the costs, potential cost animal welfare that some breeding strategies can bring. So indeed, farm animal welfare is a central component of sustainability. While COVID-19 raised a myriad of one welfare concerns, it really has highlighted the fragility of our food systems, and it's also provided us with a unique opportunity for radical change, whereby we can build resilience and ensure food security in the face of future challenges. And a one welfare driven transformation of livestock production will ensure safer, fairer and healthier environments. So I'd just like to thank you very much and draw your attention to two conferences. They're actually happening on either side of the EAP. Um, conference this year. The first is, is the Waffle, the Welfare of Animals at Farm and Group level, and the second in mid-September is the One Welfare World, World Conference. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Flora, for a very comprehensive view of the impacts the pandemic can have on animals, environment, and also human welfare. I think your One Welfare approach uh, sheds a very different light on the way we see things because, for example, uh, in the media, uh, a lot of attention has been given to uh, what has happened with, with livestock and with the environment. They have focused on the consequences of emergency killings and so on, but I think very little attention has been given to the to the psychological toll it can have on the human welfare as well. So it's uh, certainly a very, a very interesting angle to, to view things. Um, you have offered several, or 
outlined several uh, solutions to, to tackle this issue, both at the production, the consumption, and the, the processing and the consumption level. Um, but, uh, well, some of the things you have presented have uh, mostly affected very intensified livestock farming systems. Do you think it's um, realistic or it can be cost effective for them to scale back to, to systems that can be more adaptive in these conditions? Yeah. That's the sixty million dollar question, Isabel. You know, I mean, do we have do we run two models? You know, uh, um, like the Kipster farm there, or have pigs out in um, agroforestry settings and, and and supply a stream of, of of high value, high one welfare value meat through that stream, and then still have thousands of pigs going through the intensive model um, with all the problems of lack of resilience and everything that has and and. I just don't know if I've got an answer to that because there's still such a demand for, for cheap food, I suppose. And um, those of us who have the luxury of spending more will probably may choose this, this high one welfare, um, uh, you know, to source our food from the high one welfare systems, but that still doesn't solve the problem for everyone else who wants to eat meat. But I think, yeah. So I, I just don't know though about the sustainability of, of, of these intensive systems. And, and while we can employ all the tech in the world to help us manage them better, you know, really they just don't have the, the resilience it seems to these shocks and the previous speakers have talked about how they are inevitably going to increase and we're going to have more of them. So it's not going to be easy, but I think there has to be more resilience built into those intensive models as well. Um, as well as developing completely alternative systems. I mean, I, I really don't know the exact solution to it, but I think we all have to get our heads together and try and find one. Yeah, we've got to find the pathway, certainly. Yeah. We have uh, one question from the audience for from Jan Ledoux, and he says, uh, to be less than welfare friendly, how can we encourage more local investment in processing capacity to overcome some of these welfare problems? Yeah, I mean, this is an area I've just finished developing a project on alternative pig production systems and trying to create a, another production stream in Ireland and talking to people in the industry. They're saying brilliant and the government is offering money to develop these. But where are we going to kill our pigs? And I've spoken to some butchers and they're just exasperated about the, the amount of legislation and requirements and financial requirements that are being continuously placed in them. So they're saying you know, the farm to fork and all these strategies are advocating that we have more local produce and but but unless there's a huge drive in policy change, you know, to to um, I mean, I don't know what some of the people I've spoken to have talked about is that the the, the requirements are developed for intensive um, and large scale processing, whatever, and that there needs to be a separate set. And I don't think, you know, that I, I think, again, going back to the one size fits none. You can't apply that same set of um, conditions onto a smaller local abattoir. They still obviously have to meet all the food safety requirements and that, but there must be a way of um, ameliorating some of those requirements that are really all have been developed for the large scale um, processing um, industries. And I think that would be one step, but like certainly everything will fail, I think, if we don't redress the continuing closure of, of local abattoirs um, because we're at nothing with our development of alternative systems and everything if there's nowhere to kill the animals locally. Um, do you see an opportunity here? Oh, so, oh, sorry. Do you see an opportunity here for, a, uh, I don't know, for reviewing the very strict uh, rules that these uh, local abattoirs have to comply with? Yeah, well, well that's exactly I guess what I'm what I'm saying is about, you know, and maybe there has to be, you know, there's a need for some new research in this area. Again, just a very recent conversation with a small processor here who is killing pigs for a lot of these high welfare systems. And he was saying that um, his sow, his cold sow carcasses have to be below a certain temperature before he can put them on the truck to be transported to Germany. Um, but he said like the new refrigerated trucks can bring down the temperature very quickly and there's been that that requirement was based on very old research, you know, for trucks that, you know, they're so high tech now and their refrigeration capacities are so high. So there's, there's research gaps there as well, for sure, which will need to inform then maybe 
the development of a new set of guidelines for, for small processors and small butchers. Mm -hmm. That opens a whole new area of research. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, we will move now to the to the next presentation. Thank you very much, Laura. Thank you. Now we will have the presentation by uh, Mike Lee. Michael is an expert in sustainable livestock production, uh, focusing and highlighting the role in human and planetary health. He has a background in animal nutrition and has worked in several institutes and universities like Aberystwyth or the University of Bristol. And only recently, he has moved to Harper Adams University. He has published a large number of articles, including very recent ones in Nature and Science. And for his services to animal science, Michael was awarded the Sir John Hammond Memorial Prize by the British Society of Animal Science where he is currently vice president and will soon take the presidency next April. He is also a very active VAP member where he is president of our Livestock Farming Systems Commission. And uh, today, uh, Michael will analyze the impact of COVID-19 on the food supply and on sustainable livestock systems. So. My name is Michael Lee, and I am Deputy Vice Chancellor at Harper Adams University. Um, you, the European Federation of Animal Science has asked me to talk about COVID 19's impact on the food supply chain and aspects of sustainable livestock systems. As we're all aware, there have been many global challenges which require scientific solutions, not just COVID 19. For example, we, we need to concentrate on how we improve our diets. The diets that we consume have had major impacts on the health of all nations, and therefore we need to consider the role of diet in human health and make sure that the food that we grow and raise is delivering to human health. We also need to tackle farm incomes and ensure that farms are resilient and robust and economically viable and delivering the future um, food systems that will drive health. We have lots of pressure on land. We wish to protect biodiversity. We do not want agricultural encroachment into rich biodiverse lands like the Amazon, the steppes and the Pampinas. And at the same time, we have a world growing pop human population. So how are we going to feed more people with the same amount of agricultural land? So therefore, we have to farm more efficiently and use, utilize land um, more appropriately with growing pressures, not just for food, but recreate recre recreational use and also for energy and fiber. Climate change, we don't even have status quo, the type of systems that we have now and the agriculture we have now is not the agriculture we're going to need or, or have um, in 10 to 15 years time. So we need to consider the robust sort of agriculture that will deliver food systems in a very variable climate. We need to wean ourselves off chemicals and high impact inputs um, and look at more a circular economy and an agroecological or biological approach of farming and wean ourselves off chemical agriculture. And then, of course, COVID-19 has had huge impacts on the food system and all our lives. So none of these things can be tackled in isolation. They must be collect, uh, tackled together and they all need scientific solutions. Particularly if we consider COVID-19 and the impact it's had on the food sector. Ways that we can work around looking at a future um, food system is that we need to develop a roadmap of support across the food supply sector all the way from primary production on farm to the consumer at home. 
How we consume and access our food has changed during COVID-19, possibly forever. And also how we grow food and raise animals has changed. Access to labor, particularly international recruitment, uh, has changed during the pande pandemic and that may never return to how it was before. So what we produce and how we supply it needs to change. And opportunities may align with national food strategies which will link food to health. And we need to consider the food that we produce as the health industry to drive human health to make us more robust to the challenges of the next unfortunate pandemic that may hit us and therefore ensure that we're in a better position to be able to tackle that. I think COVID-19 has really shown that a, a refocus on obesity and metabolic syndrome driven by poor diet, as these have led to increased risk of death and poor health associated with COVID-19. So what are the, the shocks that COVID-19 has applied to the food system? Well, it's across many areas from food production, food processing, food retailers, and also the consumer. So what I want to look now at each of these and consider some of the challenges that COVID-19 has applied and some of the solutions. First of all, in terms of food production, well, one of the major challenges associated with our farming industries is access to labour. The closure of borders um, during the pandemic has reduced international war workforces on farms. Farms are usually uh, rely heavily on this international labour force and so that has changed the way that farmers are going to develop in the future. For example, fluctuating demand for milk has, has led to dumping of um, milk by farmers. So for example, the aeronautics industry, which required um, milk supply from a particular producer because they were no longer flying, then they closed the requirement for that, um, that, that milk production. And therefore anyone who's in that supply chain had no way to sell their milk and the only way that you could get rid of it was to dump it. So we need more resilient supply chains. Increasing demand and order variability from retailers resulted in the meat industry having carcass imbalances and dim diminishing revenues. There was risk to global supply uh, continuity for critical inputs for feed, supplements and medicine vaccinations, the supply of those from all around the world. There's increased scrutiny in how food is produced and wider issues of sustainability in what we eat. Consumers will start to look at their health and understanding how that's related to the food that they consume. So how was food, how was food producers, how are farmers responded? Well, we need to have investment in precision agriculture, improving efficiency and net zero. As we look at COVID-19, we can consider uh, one health approaches when we think of how we're going to improve our food systems. Digitalization and data management to support supply chains. There's been a growing need and realization that we need to test the resilience of food systems within virtual worlds. So applying how different farming methodologies can be used on a virtual farm before we apply it to the real world. And this will test the resilience of different interventions and the impact it will have on the supply of healthy food. Agricultural engineering needs to um, work to improve the sector, new ways of farming, as we're going to have reduced access to international labour forces. A greater understanding of the healthiness of food has also triggered growing interest in sustainability assessment on farm. Farming for health, not just for healthy food, but a healthy environment. All of these need to be considered in the new way of 
building back stronger our agricultural industry following COVID-19. We need to prepare and influence delivery of national agricultural policy to ensure that we embed resilience in producing high quality food that is in one with human and planetary health. And to support this, we need to give farmers the tools to be able to access how resilient and sustainable their farms are. For example, really good carbon toolkits and biodiversity assessment on farm. So actually, when farmers are looking at how they improve their systems, they have the methodology to determine where they're benchmarking and where their baseline is. In terms of food processing and the meat sector challenges, well, there are huge um, challenges associated with the meat industry, particularly during meat processing, because social you know, distancing guidelines were unpragmatic in those particular close working environments, on, for example, on the slaughter line. Conditions in these highly suited uh, highly, uh, sorry, conditions in these environments were highly suitable for viral transfer and there often were high COVID-19 hotspots associated with um, meat processing because of the environment, cold and humid. A sudden fluctuation in demand has resulted in beef carcass imbalance in many supply chains, leading to a significant pileup of high value hind quarters of meat, which are usually destined for the food service sector. Most inspection records and documents are handled manually by workers, for example, kill sheets, and incre this increased the risk of viral transmission between close working colleagues. And cold storage operating at full capacity with devalued frozen and prime cuts because of this stockpiling, which um, had huge uh, impacts on the resilience of the meat supply chain. And there was also a reduction in the conventional workforce capacity, as I've already indicated previously, in association to, to national uh, and international workforces. How has the sector responded? Well, there's been a clear policy um, in most countries around scaling back on meat imports at a time when national meat industries are facing carcass imbalance due to demand fluctuation, particularly a focus within the UK. There's been improved supply chain resilience through investment in value change, chains, brand development and online presence with links through to retail. There's been job opportunities for local willing workforces and also setting up alternative distribution channels, home delivery logistics to mitigate the inefficiencies of the predominant buyer driven model. And I've got an example here of some meat box schemes produced by lo local butchers uh, for local sales or, or home delivery in um, different villages and towns. In terms of food retailers, the challenges, while well, lockdown has put considerable pressure on meat and dairy markets, which resulted in unsustainable market prices and rapid changes in food distribution systems. But actually it was the view rather than the actual what was happening within the industry which caused these stockpiles. News and viral videos of empty supermarket shelves influence consumer confidence in food supply systems, resulting in stockpiling and changing people's buying behaviour. Waiting time for online deliveries were a major issue for many, and lack of key ingredients for home cooking during lockdown. Interest in sustainable options, however, rose during this, and there was a huge increase in buying local. How did retailers respond? Well, they addressed ways that consumers wished to shop in store and online so that shoppers felt safe. There was a huge shift to online purchasing, but also the types of foods purchased. More time to cook, so therefore people changed the type of foods that they were buying and spent more time cooking them and spending at home because of lockdown. 
But this was not just related to COVID-19 concerns. Other issues around sustainability rose also. There was a greater realization about what they purchased and how it impact on the environment. Investment in online presence and sustainability assessment schemes has, has been rising within food retailers and also local food boxes and house deliveries. Huge increases on online presence, for example, Ocado and also Amazon Food. How did the consumers change? Well, clear changing how consumer purchase and access food. Clearly, consumers have changed. Linked to the types of food they wish to purchase and also time taken to prepare and enjoy the food. And this may uh, have changed for good. There's been a greater focus on other issues related to food, particularly sustainability and animal welfare, as consumers become more switched on to the type of food they're buying online. COVID-19's greater impact on the obese and poor health population has given a new focus on healthy eating. And it's important to tackle the cheap food paradox, i.e. that the foods that are least healthy are often the foods that are cheaper to buy and easier to access. And foods that are grown with a more um, sustainability focus and are healthier are often more expensive and more difficult to access. So it's vital that the correct information is dissem disseminated critically about the role of livestock and products that drive human health. And there's been a rise in veganism and flexitarianism. And therefore we need to be clear about the key role that livestock can play in a healthy balanced diet and the role of an omnivorous diet in delivering human and planetary health, but also be um, aware of the impacts and challenges of overeating, whether that be a plant-based diet or an omnivorous diet. So we need to be clear of how the livestock sector is going to respond in light of COVID-19 with a focus on health. And therefore, when we talk about livestock products, we need to be talking about their nutritional value versus their environmental footprint. Moving away from comparing uh, livestock products just as a weight and think about the nutrients they contain. So move away from carbon dioxide equivalents per kilogram of product and move towards carbon dioxide equivalents per percentage recommended daily intake of key nutrients that different livestock products contain. And that's what's shown in this slide here. We have the main nutrients on the left-hand side associated to why livestock products are part of an Eat Well plate. The recommended daily intake, the RDI of those key nutrients, proteins, micronutrients, long chain fatty acids. And then the proportion of these nutrients that different livestock products will give on, um, in a 100 gram um, serving. And when we compare the environmental footprint of these um, 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 products um, based on their nutritional value, some of the rankings that we have considered previously, for example, between chicken and beef, change over. So that you actually have a lower environmental footprint of, for beef because of its high nutrient density. And, and when we consider the environmental role and the environmental impact of livestock, we need to include their nutritional value. So sustainability is complex. And we, in, if we're thinking about livestock systems, we need to ensure that we deliver all three pillars of sustainability. So producing products, uh, animal-based products that deliver human health, that provide robust businesses, which are, going to infure, in, in, which are going to ensure the future generation of farmers coming through into the industry. And also that we're the first generation that leaves this planet in a better state that we have found it. So therefore we're reducing, reducing emissions and producing food in an environmentally friendly way. And central to all these three pillars are, is health whether that be soil, plant, animal, and human. 
COVID-19 has been one external shock to the agriculture and livestock sector, but there are many others. Social change. We are changing the way we think about our food, what we consume and what we want from our food. There's been many changes in different eating practices, flexitarianism, veganism, and therefore we need to consider how food systems will deliver health. Injustice. There's huge injustice uh, within country and across the world in terms of access to food, rising poverty, people not having um, the control of their finances to make the correct purchase decisions. This cheap food paradox we needs to be addressed so that healthy food is available to all and informed choices around the, the benefits of a healthy, balanced, omnivorous diet needs to be clear and accessible. International trade, particularly within the UK, as we've left the European Union, how we interact with other um, countries and organisations uh, around a just transfer of, of food systems. Urbanisation, as countries get richer, people move from rural communities and into cities. And when they do, they consume differently. They consume more and they have this nutrition transition with greater demand for readily available foods. And, and again, they change the way that they actually eat, purchase and the type of foods that they consume, which has huge pressures on human and planetary health. And of course, I've already mentioned climate change. The agriculture we have now may not be the agriculture we need in 10, 15 years time. So central to all this is how farming systems will respond and they cannot be tackled independently. They need to be tackled in concert, collectively, working together. My last slide is just an exemplar of a collaboration to show how organisations and countries can work together to find answers to more sustainable um, livestock systems, and in particularly in this case, the Global Farm Platform, sustainable ruminant livestock systems. And working together, thinking of how different ways of raising livestock in different eco-climates can, can can contribute to a sustainable food system so we can tackle challenges such as uh, COVID-19. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. It has been a very, very interesting talk in which you have uh, uh, demonstrated the very multifaceted aspects of the shocks uh, COVID has meant for agriculture. Uh, you have presented the different challenges for producers, retailers, consumers, and different solutions to this challenge, which is obviously not the only one that the livestock sector is facing. Yes, you said there's social change, climate change, and uh, many other many other aspects that are also affecting the sector. Um, uh, you presented different systems that responded in a, in a different manner. Who do you think were the, the best uh, prepared? Who were in the best position to respond? Apparently, there, were, there are some small scale oper operators which have a good level of organization that enables them to, to connect the different stakeholders of the supply chain and reach the market. What, um, uh, what, what do you think uh, lies the, the success of the, of the adaptation to, to a situation like this one? Yes, thank you, Isabel. I, I actually found the, the retail chain responded extremely well. Um, I, I presented in the slide, you know, that there was issues with stockpiling, but often that was just driven by incorrect information driven by the media, you know, that there was going to be food shortages. So people went out and bought more and that's what caused the issues. But actually the retailers and the supply chains themselves dealt with it extremely well. Um, and dealt with how consumers changed very quickly. You know, this greater realization of what, how consumers were changing what they consumed. 
you know, retailers know an awful lot about us due to our purchase decisions, uh, whether we're using uh, credit cards or we're using online, and, and they're making very quick decisions about what we want. You know, the rise in Ocado and the rise of Amazon Food, for example, who can make decisions and suggestions about what you want to purchase before you even know what you want to purchase. So they responded to it extremely well in a way of changing their business models. Um, and that will never go back. Um, that, that those, those changes are here now. And people who have moved onto online shopping, you know, a proportion of them will move back but not everybody will move back. Still a vast amount will still stay online. So I think the retailers have responded extremely well to it in that sector. Um, there have been challenges with local production chains and, and access. There has been a growing interest in how food is produced and buying local, but still at the same time, you know, you've got this other side of saying, I like to buy local, but actually, buying all my food online is really accessible and easy, uh, even if it isn't local. So you've got these two mixed churches that have been growing. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, we have different niches that we can that we can target, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have uh, one question from the audience from Professor Giovanni Vitante. He says, what do you think about the increased confidence in science as a consequence of pandemia? Could this also be true for animal science? Yeah, great question, Giovanni. Yeah, there's been obviously, um, as as science has delivered the vaccine, you know, there's been his increased um, view that you know that the public's in safe hands with our scientific community. But also in terms of livestock, and I think Laura emphasised extremely well in her presentation about zoonotic risks and the way that humans interacted with animals, dumping their pets when they thought actually there could be this transmission risk. Um, and there was a right, and the anti-livestock brigade were very quick to try and show a risk of COVID-19 associated with livestock and the meat processors. I think the livestock industry as a whole has dealt with that extremely well, has been very open and transparent with the issues. Um, the data, again, which um, Christian and Lara presented have shown, you know, some of the issues and risks associated with zoonotic diseases, but actually, you know, what that low risk associated with humans. Um, I think there's been this greater realization and, and, and understanding about epidemiology and, you know, and, and, and transmission and changes within viruses. So, I actually think you know, there's been a lot of good information that's been put out and I think the public are more informed. Um, and so even though obviously COVID-19 has had catastrophic uh, impact on so many families, um, I really feel that for the next pandemic and there will be a next pandemic, unfortunately, um, hopefully everyone's more in tune with what needs to be done and hopefully governments are more in tune with what needs to be done to support the scientific community um, because I think the, 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 the public is very much aware of the investment that was needed in science to deliver a solution and if that investment wasn't there in science what a big mess we would be in now. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, we have some other questions here. One is from uh, uh, Luciano Pinotti. He says, uh, in your presentation, you mentioned the an anti-livestock agenda. Can you develop, develop a bit more about it? And do you think that COVID-19 has accelerated this agenda? Yeah, I, I, I do, unfortunately, because there has been this view about um, what's been driving ill health and metabolic syndrome, and this view that plant-based solutions will always be environmentally benign and healthier than livestock alternatives. But of course, that's not true. Uh, and Laura showed very well, you know, the, the, the healthy Mediterranean diet. So it's all about balance uh, and the role that livestock play in healthy diets. Um, and that's what I was trying to emphasize in my slide. And I don't think I did it particularly well with, I don't like pre-recordings, as I've mentioned to Andrea before, but you know the fact that when you think about livestock in terms of the key nutrients it provides, where it sits in an eat well plate, 
and working with national food strategies to actually get the true evidence around the vital roles that livestock play, particularly dairy um, in terms of calcium levels, but also um, meat in terms of uh, bioavailable iron and vitamin B12. But of course, it's got to be in moderation. And I think the anti-livestock brigade have been so quick to draw lines and conclusions around bad health, livestock, and COVID-19. And of course, the, 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 those, those correlations are not necessarily there, but if you eat badly, you often overconsume livestock products. But of course you can eat well and eat livestock products. Thank you. We have one question here uh, concerning health, which can be uh, maybe answered by Christian. It says that um, health was mentioned to be central. So do you think we have enough, uh, enough of an idea of the disease burden in our livestock, nationally and individually on farm, to be able to efficiently tackle these of an endemic diseases in order to increase health and welfare and ultimately the sustainability of farming? I think yes, we do know pretty well uh, what is the, the shape of the health of our livestock. And I think we can say uh, in, in Europe in general that we do have a very, very possibly the most efficient uh, system of livestock health that does exist on earth. Uh, the problem is, uh, or the fact is, that there will be always new challenges and that uh, we need always to readapt ourselves to new environments, new circumstances. And uh, as uh, animal production systems change, and possibly now there is a, a kind of trend towards more open air, more extensive, more animal uh, welfare friendly and so production. This is very good from several aspects. But from the health aspect, it's not always the most easy way to tackle diseases, uh, particularly uh, when you are thinking of things like uh, tuberculosis in, in many animals, uh, African swine fever and others in pigs, uh, maybe even uh, salmonella or avian flu in birds. Uh, those are a bit more challenging to tackle in, in uh, more extensive systems. So it is not a problem but it is something that we continuously need to adapt to and to think of, that's all. Yeah, thanks very much, Christian. We have a couple of questions by Phil, Phil Gansworthy. Uh, I think they are addressed to Michael. Uh, one is about the cheap food paradox. It, he says that it is, it's valid, but how can you overcome it for people who use food banks? And the other concerns also, how can the, the milk production chain be resilient when it uh, has problems like the losing the airline market and there's a little margin. So uh, resilient uh, may cause uh, um, quite important economic problems. Yeah, th th thank you, Phil. And I, I think I can uh, tackle both those questions together because I think they, they do uh, to align. Yes, you're right. The cheap food paradox is very, very complicated to, to resolve but it needs to be um, and that needs government and it needs policy um, because there are many people in society who have not got the control of their finances and can make the correct decisions and so therefore there needs to be support in uh, making sure that food is accessible to those individuals um, and, and, and that really needs good political, political intervention. In terms of resilience within the dairy sector, yeah, totally agree again, you know, the, the, those major challenges if you're, if you are a provider for the airline industry and no flame, planes are flying, what happens to your milk if there's no one that's going to process it into those little plastic tubs? So what, what happens then? Well, first of all, we shouldn't have those little plastic tubs if we're thinking about sustainability. But we've got to have resilience within the wider component of redirecting food for where it's needed. You just mentioned, Philip, within your question about food banks, um, you know, dumping gallons of high quality nutritional milk because actually the one purchaser who was aligned to that system um, no longer needed it is not a responsible use of that food. So therefore, there's got to be mechanisms put in place which can capture and support farmers to redirect that. 
that's complicated. That needs economics and um, systems resilience analysts to determine that. And, and that's why I mentioned about this virtual world, um, trying the, 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 the resilience of different food chains with different perturbations. So testing how um, resilient a, a, a dairy production system can be when you close off one particular market and making sure then there is a mechanism or transfer of those nutrients into a different market. Um, so it's that sort of wider uh, assessment that needs to be uh, included. And the major advancements within the retail sector that are doing this already, Ocado, for example, are doing this. They're understanding how um, food demands and when food gets to a certain point in terms of sell by date, it goes into food um, baskets and uh, sorry, into um, um, to supporting people within uh, who can't access food into, into food markets. So, yeah, in, in some way that, that, that we need better resilience and ability to test within the virtual world before applying into the real world. Food banks, that was the word I was after. Sorry, Phil. Um, we have a question here that maybe can be answered from, from any of you three. It's uh, from Roger Laurent, and it says, uh, the repartition of the added value in the whole chain, and especially at the farm level, uh, how can sustainability, health, and the environment be better paid and recognized at the EU level uh, for the local supply instead of global supply? supply? And consider as all the consumers are, uh, and how to consider it because uh, all consumers are now concerned with these issues. So, who takes the lead here? Any of you wants to answer this question? Laura? <laughs> I don't know. I was trying to fully understand it. Is it about how do we for get people to pay more for, for, for food or, or, or yeah. Um, like, I, like this is the fundamental problem, you know, the cheap food model. We wouldn't have this in small profit margins on milk and, and the lack of resilience there because of it. If people were prepared to pay more for quality. I mean, maybe it's a bit of a utopian notion that, that, that people you know, we've created this this um, dependence on cheap food so that we can have so much more of our income to spend on, on all the other products and goods and phones and cars that, that drive an economy. Um, and food doesn't drive an economy, I suppose. So it's, it's, in, it's in kind of, it's in everyone's national interest to keep that as a small portion of the consumer's expenditure. But yes, the costs, um, are enormous that we're paying to have the luxury of cheap food so we can spend money on all the other things that drive an economy. So like, it seems to me that it, it, it requires, you know, enormous political change or, or, or policy change because um, we've created a dependence amongst people on paying very little for their food and now we're expecting them to pay. And they've, they've believed, I think, that it, food was all, it was a given that it was animal welfare friendly. It was a given that it was a healthy. I think consumers just expected that, you know, and they didn't realize, and they don't realize that, that, that for farmers, it, it was impossible to meet all those demands when the margin was shrinking, you know, year on year. So um, there's a huge conundrum there that I don't know how we're going to solve, but I do think it takes enormous political change, radical change and policy change and, and maybe I'm being naive even in saying that but you know I, we always get it thrown back to us when you ask a consumer and um, will they pay more for higher welfare you know I want the you know the animal's welfare to be good I want the environment but I, will you pay more well maybe not and we hold them responsible then it's your fault but, but they've just assumed that all of that is a given when they buy their produce and, and it, it hasn't, it's been eroded and eroded away. And, and I, I just think, I think for all of us, we have to reevaluate what we spend our money on and, and um, you know, that our own, our health and the health of our children are at risk if we don't prepare to spend more, but, but I don't think it's enough. I think it has to be supported by policy. I don't know if, if that makes sense, but 
they're my thoughts on it. Yeah, there's been a, a lot of discussion around, um, you know, I agree with everything Laura said, you know, it, it is extremely complicated, but, you know, the true cost accounting of food, so the view that the polluter pays, so if you're producing food that pollutes, um, then you pay for the cleanup, you, you, you pay for water quality improvement, you pay for greenhouse gas emissions and, and carbon uh, capture. Um, of course, that needs to be part of a, an equitable um, supply chain. And of course, then the consumer needs to, to pick up that bill if they want those products that are more environmentally damaging. But also aligned to environmental health, you've got human health. So if you eat inappropriately, you consume inappropriately, you will cut burden the, the health system. And that will have a cost associated with it. So you could extrapolate true cost accounting for the impact of human and planetary health. And that would naturally make um, polluting foods and um, unhealthy. unhealthy foods more costly. Mm. Um, and hopefully then by definition, healthier foods and least polluting foods will be less uh, costly. So that's all part of a changing paradigm associated with it. But we, we need to also be extremely fair about um, how foods are produced within the environ of a farm. So actually not just um, demonize uh, a production system, say for example, milk production, because you've got enteric fermentation of the cow, but actually think about what that cow is also doing in the part of the rider farm. So if that farm has hedgerows, trees, high investment in soil quality, then that is rewarded for the farmer, not just the detriment to the enteric fermentation. If that dairy is using byproducts and recycling um, industrial waste streams that would never otherwise be lost or uh, not be used for producing high quality nutrition, then that farmer is also rewarded for that. So there's many of these different aspects that we need to consider within a new healthier food system for both human and planetary. But we need good politicians. Yeah, <laughs> bottom line. Not just good scientists. We have a question here concerning the direction research should take in, uh, in this case, they are asking about if it should be active in the value chain and the correct payment of, of farmers. But I would like to, to broaden this question to all of you and have a final remark from, from your part on uh, where should uh, research in your field uh, be addressed so that it can better tackle uh, the possible consequences we can have, not from only from this pandemic, but from other challenges that livestock is mm. the livestock sector is is facing. So, mm. can we start with uh, well, in the order you have in the order you have presented, for example, Christian, maybe? Fine. So I think uh, I mean there are of course many many ch challenges regarding uh, animal health and and uh, 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 in the field of animal science and after after the COVID crisis or during the COVID crisis. But I think there are two points that are very, very important and that are already reflected somehow in the new calls uh, in the, in the uh, European programs and also in the national ones. Uh, one of them is uh, the switch from using uh, more antibiotics towards using alternatives to antibiotics. This, this goes from the prebiotics to the probiotics to the postbiotics and all the other uh, options that there are uh, essentially to improve the immune system instead of uh, fighting against the bugs themselves. Uh, so that's that's one area, including the use of the knowledge on the microbiota on uh, in, in, in this regard. Hmm? Uh, and then the other very large field where there is a lot of uh, things to do still, although uh, we are building on, on, on good and on, on sound existing knowledge, is the field of biosafety in a very broad sense. The, not just the interaction between uh, wildlife and domestic animals or between different herds or different species of domestic animals, but uh, also the, the broader sense of biosafety that may include uh, vectors, that may include airborne risks, waterborne risks, uh, slurry-borne risks. 
uh, all these kind of things. So I think these these two fields regarding animal health are probably uh, uh, expecting some growth in the next uh, years. Thanks very much, Christian. And concerning welfare, Laura? Well, following on from something Christian said there, where he mentioned, you know, we've got to look at, instead of tackling the bugs, get the immune system working and animal health. And he listed a whole, and I would add animal welfare to that because there's, and there's only some very recent few studies showing how say keeping pigs in a high welfare environment has beneficial effects when you're challenged them with disease, for example. And you see, and like, it's just, so I would say that animal welfare going even further back is, is, is one of the key ways of improving animal health and reducing antimicrobial usage and the threat of antimicrobial resistance. But I would definitely say, and because following on from my one welfare, advocate, advocation of one welfare, advocacy of one welfare, I should say, that I think we all have to start working better together. In you know, we, we all talk about projects that are multidisciplinary, but we do we really, you know, work together to create more than um, what we would do individually in a kind of a transdisciplinary fashion. And I think that evaluating any system now or any management or any is, is pointless unless we do it holistically and include all actors in the chain: the animal, the environment, the human. There's no point in going out and evaluating a, a grazing strategy unless you make sure, for example, that it's good for the environment, the animal won't suffer or whatever. And I think that that kind of holistic approach um, is what I would advocate in, in, in all our research going forward um, to ensure sustainability, yeah. Thanks very much, Laura. I see no other way either. <laughs> Michael? Yeah, t totally agree um, with both Christian and Laura, you know, particularly the importance of multidisciplinary research and cross boundary research. You know, um, pandemics, uh, greenhouse gas, um, and everything that's uh, affecting our global planet doesn't recognize these little anthropogenic lines on, on a map called countries. You know, th they're just something that we've made up. Um, but the, the future of the planet um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to ensure that we can be better positioned for the next global pandemic will rely on collaboration and multidisciplinary research. Uh, I really like Laura's One Welfare, you know, but which driven from One Health. Um, you know, we, we've got to consider, um, you know, human planetary uh, and livestock disease. And I think what COVID-19 has really done, it is putting into everybody's viewpoint how susceptible humans are to disease and how we are not just the complete controls of our destiny. Mm -hmm. um, that actually biology has a, a, a way of, of smacking us in the face mm -hmm. if we don't give it due respect. And therefore an understanding about livestock systems, biodiversity, you know, Christian mentioned about um, uh, the pangenomic response, about greater understanding of human health and the role that microbes have within our gut, but also the interactions that we have within livestock systems as part of a biological system and biodiversity and how our food system ties in with that. So I really do like the idea of, of circular economies. And if you do like the idea of a circular economy in terms of sustainability, you've got to respect and understand the importance of livestock because they're a critical component of that. Uh, but also I think Laura picked it up right at the start, which is the vital role of companion animals. Um, and we mustn't forget that, you know, although it, it's really distressing and heart to hear that we, we, people were throwing their pets out during the pandemic, but so many people relied on their pets during uh, lockdown. Um, and so I think we've got a greater understanding the importance of the interaction between humans and animals, whether they be companion animals, livestock or wildlife. You're here. So thanks very much to the three of you and also to Martin, who isn't with us anymore, because you have, uh, you have presented very diverse topics. You've had a, a a very interesting conversation about uh, the impacts uh, we can see of this or of any pandemic on our livestock sector. 
Um, and it's clear that we will have to deal with uncertainty in the future, but that science, both basic and applied, and applied science, will be there to, to help provide solutions to, to anything that, my, that the livestock sector may face. Um, it's obvious that we will have to target uh, system resilience sometimes, adaptability or even transformability. Uh, for some for some situations, but uh, I think uh, what you have presented today will will help uh, uh, attain these objectives uh, in the many different livestock farming systems that we have in Europe and and beyond. So thank you very much to to all of you for your availability and the very um, uh, enlightening presentations that you've uh, you've done today. And thanks very much also to, to all our audience for being there. I remind you that uh, you will soon receive a, a questionnaire uh, for gathering your, your opinions about how, how this seminar went and uh, what we can do in the future with this new AP webinar series. And I'd like to uh, remind you that we have the uh, or following uh, or following webinar next uh, 31st of, of March. I don't know if I'm sharing my screen, sorry. Can't you see the, the program of the webinar of the incident yes, webinar? We can see okay. It as well. Yeah, sorry. I, I, I was lost. I didn't I didn't know which screen I was on. So thanks very much to you all and hopefully see you see you at the end of this month in, in our next webinar. So thank you. We will close here. Thanks very much. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Isabel. Thanks, EAP. Yes, thanks a million. Bye bye.